morning. Good morning. And before the snow comes, um, this is the beginning of Holy Week, and we praise the Lord. We have some announcements that we'd like to draw to your attention. All of them are important, of course. And those of you who are going to be involved with anything next Sunday, please note that there are sign-up sheets in the narthex um, that uh, have to do with uh, uh, Easter festivities. I want to remind everybody, of course, on Wednesday evening, it will be the last uh, Wednesday in uh, Advent, that um, Alejandro will be delivering the sermon, then we have Monday Thursday services, and then, of course, at noon on Friday, uh, we have the Good Friday services as well. Are there any other announcements that need to be made at this time? All right. Very grateful that um, uh, Reverend Cochran is our liturgist today. And with that, we'll begin our worship in silence. Of our hearts, 
Cleanse us from all our sins, and deliver us from all our thoughts and vain desires. With holiness and meekness, may we draw near to you, confessing our faults, confiding in your grace, and finding in you our refuge and strength, through Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. And here is the assurance of pardon, the good news. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. The old has passed away. Everything is new. All this is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Are there any children today? see the bears in Maryland? Yeah. They're in the mountains, <coughs> that's true. But we're glad you're here. Happy Palm Sunday. Ha! Huh, Palm Sunday, what does that mean? You know what it means, don't you? How many years have you been doing this? It's the Sunday that Jesus walked on the palm. It's the, Jesus, it's the Sunday that Jesus walked on the palm. Yeah. That's exactly right. Like these palms, right? Yeah. <coughs> They're palm leaves. They're not banana trees. <laughs> banana tree leaves. I know. He's silly, isn't he? These are palm leaves. <laughs> ah, yes. You tell me, <coughs> Mr. Question. They're what? They're real. All right, so why do you suppose, you know all the answers, why did they take these? Because um, they took them and they put them on the ground and they Jesus was walking. I know, but why did they why did they use these? Why didn't they use oak leaves? They are not oak leaves. I know they're not. So why did they use palm branches? Because in the Bible it says that when the king comes, they put their palms down like that, and then you're exactly right. And then Jesus was on the donkey and he rode on in on the donkey, right? I know, well, that's what Jesus did, so there. What so, did he actually, he walked on the palms? He walked on what? He didn't exactly walk. Yes, he walked on the palms, yes. Oh, no, he, oh, no, he, walked, no, he didn't. He, the, he went on a donkey. He rode he on a donkey. <laughs> All right. I, told you I know, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I know. You're right. All right. So, uh, so he's going into Jerusalem, right? Right. And he's gonna and do the people like that? Yeah. They do. Yeah. yeah. And so this is it. So that's what we do on Palm Sunday. Now Palm Sunday is the start of what week? You know? What do we call this is week? Picture? Not quite. Easter. Next week is next, Easter. next week is Easter. Easter. Okay. And this week begins what kind of week? What do we call it? Do you remember? Palm, Palm Sunday. Sunday. Not Palm Sunday, but it begins with Palm Sunday and close. Holy Week. Holy Week. Oh, what does holy mean? Um, God. Yeah, it means God, yeah. God. And and the word holy also means uh, means separate from. So this is means that this is separate from other weeks because this is a real special week, right, Thomas? And what do we do this week? Who do we think about? Jesus. And we think about what what parts about Jesus? What did he do this week? The 
Palm leaf, heart, and what else? And uh, he's going to Jerusalem. And he's going to Jerusalem, and what else? Um, well, he's going to also go to the cross and die. Yes, next week he's going to die. And then what's going to happen? And then um, next week, after three days, he's going to awake. He's going to wake, okay. <laughs> I will talk about that next week. So, that's... That, that means he died and then he woke up. That's pretty well, good. He, he came back to life. Better, yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. So what we're going to do now is we're going to sing a song. He is exalted. Who's going to help me? You can help sing. You know the words. Okay. Why don't you stand up right here? Ready? Play through once, please. <laughs>
Thank you, choir, very much, as always, for your good work. Now time to turn our attention that concerns the church universal and the church in particular, this church and all its friends and members. And I do want to point out that uh, the flowers this Palm Sunday are in celebration of our old friend Bob Watts' 86th birthday. And Bob passed away, what, about a year ago, maybe, or a year ago? Uh, Ten years ago? Five, six. Six years ago. Six? Well, doesn't seem possible. So, lift up Bob, all right? Glad we could do that. All right, are there any prayers that we need to lift up this morning in particular? Yes. Um, got some good news this week. Susan Furukawa used to attend here. Um, has been offered a tenure position at Beloit College in Wisconsin. Wow. So they'll be moving this summer. That's a wonderful school. Yeah. Well, good for them. Happy days. Any other? Yes. Travel mercies for Garrett here. Hey, I went to one minute. Yes, go on. No. Um, Doc, for the family of Don Walters, and he was a manager at the plumbing plant. He passed away from surgery oh dear. last week. Okay. It's a joy to have Sammy back. <laughs> I was going to comment on that. And when, where was Sammy? Instead of being down on the beaches of Florida, where was Sammy? Honduras. And what were you doing there? Um, Creating rural banks. Yeah, so that's something. So I, I'm really proud of him, and I, it's, I've said this before. A couple years ago, in a matter of fact, it was two years ago, uh, the Warden family took their uh, spring break, and they went to uh, southern Indiana and helped build homes of the people who uh, had their homes destroyed by the <coughs> tornado. So that's quite a sacrifice. <coughs> I appreciate that. And thank you. <coughs> thank you. Uh, did you go to Tegucigalpa or? We flew in there. But you didn't see the, um, you didn't see Valerie or any of those people that? No. Okay. Bill? Yes. Uh, we should pray for Bud Wyman. Mm -hmm. He was in the hospital this week for uh, dialysis. dialysis. And he had, yes, he had a um, ports put in, or a port put in. Yes. <coughs> Who else? Brenda? Now, Brenda's family is just having a heck of a time right now, and so we're going to lift them up. And her mother and father, quite other father particularly, is very, very ill. So uh, and I went and saw him the other day, and he's, he's, he's not well. All right. Alan. Um, I like prayers for my friend Winnie. And um, for me, tomorrow, I have to follow up on the problem with my eyes. Mm. Then right. let's let's turn our attention to prayer. Grace and gracious and heavenly God, by your kindness, you have brought us here this this day, and we're mindful that it is spring, um, and we would ask that we would enjoy it as such, regardless of the omen of, uh, of winter still here and the coming of more snow. Let us take this as an opportunity to appreciate and to relax and reflect upon Holy Week. Um, gracious and heavenly God, we come to you this day, in this perfectly good day, and we, we have in our hands a, a list of names that we ask that you be with today, and we lift them up to you when you know their names already, you call them by name. But I ask that you be with Brenda's father, Earl, in, in these um, sad times that he's going through. And if it would be possible to restore him to good health, I would please do that. If not, then let him take this as an opportunity to enjoy your company. I ask that you be with Bud Wyman as he enters this new phase in his life um, and let him embrace it and with the way that Bud can and to take what for many would be something negative and he uses an opportunity for something positive. And so blessings upon Bud and his beloved family. Um, blessings upon Don Walters and, um, and his family, upon his laws. Abide with him and his fellow workers. 
we ask that you be with Alan's friend Lenny in this time of need and physical restoration. And we ask that you be with Alan as well as he continues this, um, these difficult health issues that he's had to wrestle with over the last few years. And we would ask that he would receive good news tomorrow. Travel mercies, of course, for Garrett and Vera. Grateful that you brought Sammy back to us. We missed him. And grateful for his commitment to Christ and the work that he is showing. And, 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 and grateful that he understands that, that, that love is a behavior. And, and that we demonstrate our love by the way we behave toward other people. Thank you for helping Susan Furukawa secure employment ask that you abide with her and her children and her um, beloved husband. We thank you for this good day. We ask that you abide with us and that you would take us safely through the days to come. And we do so in the name of Jesus Christ who has taught us this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And let us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Thank you so much, and we continue now with the sharing of our tithes and our offerings. <coughs> into the hearts of your people and observe our gratitude and our generosity. May all of these offerings be used to help this church grow and be a strong witness to your redemptive grace in Christ Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Please be seated.
Our gospel reading today is from Luke chapter 19, beginning with verse 28. <clears throat> in your pew Bible, you can find that on page 803, and in the large print Bible, you can find it on page 1619. Listen for the word of God. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell him, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the coal, the owner asked them, why are you untying the coal? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it, and he went along as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. <coughs> The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Reverend Cochran. Always a joy to see you. Have you with us. And, uh... I always like hearing the gospel before I preach because it makes me think about things I've forgotten or should have said or maybe shouldn't say. I, I was, I was, what I was thinking of, this has been a really disjointed, well, really the last few weeks in our home and what was Brenda's um, father and mother being quite ill. and she having to go down there and back, and my mother's quite ill and going over and back, and it's just, it's just been crazy. And, uh, and, and, and anything but peaceful, okay? And, uh, and so I find it, and you know, whatever the right word is, I'm glad at least we're talking about um, the Prince of Peace today. Interesting thing, I, I was going to read from Josephus, and I decided not to, um, although it's kind of interesting reading, but um, the, the end of this scripture about Jesus saying what's going to happen to the people in Jerusalem and in Israel, in fact, happened. And, and, and I've said this repeatedly, some, somewhere along the line, we've been taught about how noble the Romans were and all the great things that they did and just how, just, just uh, the master race almost when in fact they were just absolute butchers. 
And what they did is Tacitus came in in about the year 70 and he went to Jerusalem and Josephus records this quite, quite well. And they surround the city and they try and put up some kind of uh, uh, embankments to try and get in there. They don't work and because they're made out of uh, dirt and so they eventually resort to, to stones. And of course what happens is that they, they, they capture the city. Before they capture the city, it's interesting, there were uh, um, Jews that were either trying to escape or feigning to escape and what the Romans would do is instead of embracing that they were telling the truth or trying to escape, they would crucify them <laughs> in, in front of the walls to teach the people inside a lesson. But when they got done teaching their lessons to the Jews, what they did is every single stone they, uh, they, they dismantled or they dismantled every single building. And then some reports say then they seeded, S-E-E-D-E-D, seeded Jerusalem with salt so that nothing would ever grow there. That's how hateful they were. And it's been estimated up to a quarter of a million Jews were crucified, crucified um, by uh, the Romans. So when, when Jesus says, this is what's going to happen to you, um, that's what happened to them. And, and that's when the, the nation of Israel ended. And there are some who will say, and people that I, who I respect, I, I respectfully disagree with them, that the nation of Israel has come back. I think it's done forever. It was totally destroyed. Totally destroyed. There are people that would say, well, that's not what happened because it came back in 1947, and perhaps <coughs> that's true. We'll see. That said, usually Palm Sunday sermons uh, I and those preachers, it seems, um, focus on Christ's uh, entry into Jerusalem as prophesied in the ninth chapter of Zechariah. Seems to me that's what we do a lot of times. And I, I could have pulled that up, but you're, I'm sure, quite familiar with that, uh, with that reading. The, the passage speaks of uh, how a king will enter Jerusalem to establish, um, in the, throughout the world, the known world at any rate, some kind of a peaceable kingdom. <clears throat> it's interesting you can take that passage and then uh, pull it out of there and, and, and it looks really wonderful if you read a little farther the butchery and the carnage then continues again. But we, we forget about that. <coughs> anyway, what we've done is we've said this is uh, the, this tells of Jesus. It's a prophecy about Jesus uh, coming into uh, to Israel or rather Jerusalem and he rides on a donkey, as does uh, uh, the personage in, in, in Zechariah, uh, which, which is a, a symbol of, uh, of meekness, riding in on a donkey instead of on a war horse, which is a symbol, of course, of conquest and aggression. And these texts, uh, the, obviously the early church, applied to Jesus as a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. And I've also noted uh, we've talked about this happy throng uh, of children and others uh, waving their palm branches or taking off their um, cloaks and, and putting them down on the ground as tradition would have it, uh, suggesting that this is the inauguration of a king. And certainly that's what was done in the ancient Near East during the time of Jesus. And happy is all of this when you, when you think about it. That's what we do. We have children come in, we sing, and pass out the palms and everybody feels good and, and, and that's, the, that's the front story to, to Palm Sunday and certainly to, to Holy Week. And, and I have no problem with that and certainly that needs to be lifted up. But today I'd like to take a broader um, view of this um, event, Palm Sunday, and I'd like to take a look at what I call the back story. Okay? The backstory that, that we don't talk about, well, I shouldn't say we don't talk about it, we, we rarely talk about it because we give um, uh, so much time to, to the, the palms and the king riding in, and this is symbolic of a new age that's about to, to happen. What I want to do, though, is in keeping with what we've been doing this, uh, um, this Lenten season, is uh, to, to focus again on the stark seriousness uh, of Jesus and, and of his passion, which of course begins with Palm Sunday. 
So what I'd like to do is to step back a little, little bit, a distance away from the triumphant entry, and listen to Jesus as he nears the eastern gate of Jerusalem. It's really interesting. I, Brent and I have been blessed. I think others have too. The Mount of Olives is still there, <clears throat> and you can see the Mount of Olives. And it's a little. It's above Jerusalem, and you can look down. And the Kidron Valley goes like this. And about oh, I don't know what it is. Three quarters of a mile away, you can see Jerusalem. It's, it really is spectacular. It, it, it truly is spectacular. And you've been there, yes. And so what Jesus did, he's in the Mount of Oz or Bethpage, wherever, and he starts down this, this slope, this slope, and then he's going to come back up to the eastern gate and go in. And I'm presuming, uh, I, well, I don't know where. That's when they start <coughs> uh, taking out the palm branches and, uh, and celebrating his entry as he comes to the city. And, and, and Jesus talks about this and this, this idea of, uh, of being uh, adorned, not adorned, uh, but surrounded by adoring uh, followers singing songs and hymns of Hosanna. This certainly comes from uh, Psalm 118. And I want to read part of this, if, if you'd be so kind and, and let me do that. I can find some glasses. <laughs> <coughs> this is 118, and I'll begin with 25. This is in Psalm 118. O Lord, save us, O Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We've heard that. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, for the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us with bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. So the idea is they're going uh, through the gates and then going up to the temple and there you have the altar. It's got these horns on each corner. They're going up the horns of the altar. And they're shouting, you are my God and I will give you thanks. You are my God and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. So there's the, there's the text that kind of explains what's going on uh, as Jesus with his followers is, is closing in on uh, Jerusalem. And, and as soon as this happens, Jesus is told by some of the Jewish leaders, in this case the Pharisees, some of the Pharisees, uh, to rebuke his disciples. And to this Jesus says, if they keep quiet, well, the stones will cry out. And uh, the sense here is that nothing now can stop what is about to happen. Nothing. And what is about to happen? That's the question. The front story says what's about to happen is Jesus is about to begin to enter Jerusalem and 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 this holy and, and claim, if you will, this formal um, anticipation or inauguration or whatever the ruler is that the kingdom of God is right here. It's it's coming or it's right here. And that Jesus is involved in this, and Jesus <coughs> is, ex is, is, is assuming this role of the king. And clearly, uh, the biblical references would suggest that. And that's the front story. <clears throat> and it's true uh, for Jesus, this, uh, this is happening. Sadly, the back story. It also, this Palm Sunday, is the beginning of the end of the nation of Israel. Again, I'm not going to get in this argument. Some people say, well, you know, in 1947, Israel has come back, and, and this is proof, and, all, and I'm not going to argue that with people. People have their theological beliefs, if not biases, and, and I'm, I'm not here to argue that. If, if that gives people comfort and they want to believe that, fine. I'm convinced that Israel is destroyed. And what you see now is a secular nation. Um, and, and it, well, it doesn't matter. Um, my, my limited attention and time and conversation with uh, Jews in Israel is that they're atheists. That's what I've discovered. But be that as it may. Um, and again, be that as it may, um, what happens, uh, the backstory 
is that something is going to happen to the nation of Israel. And it's not going to be good. And this is why we read <clears throat> Jesus, as he, as he looking, looking out to um, um, Jerusalem, he begins crying. So the second time that you read in Scripture, Jesus crying or weeping. Only the second time. Another time, you know, is when um, uh, Jesus is, and then we don't know exactly what's happening, he's there present um, with the people who are lamenting the death of Lazarus, <coughs> and he's weeping at that time too. I'm not sure why he's weeping. And that's the shortest <coughs> sentence, Jesus wept. <coughs> so that's so that's interesting that, that, that's, that Jesus is looking out and he's seen Jerusalem and he's seen Israel, and he begins to cry. And so he's drawn to tears as he approaches Jerusalem, as he approaches this inauguration or this acknowledgement or this acceptance or this celebration that something about Jesus himself has to do with being king. And at the same time that's going on, juxtaposed, if you will, is this nightmare that is about to happen to Israel. And, I, and, I, and I, the, it was a nightmare. And, and uh, read the accounts. When they talk about dashing the children's heads against the walls. That's what they did. And everything else you can imagine being done to women, they did. And human beings, the Romans did. And so Jesus sees this, and he knows what's about to happen, and he starts crying. He sees the ruination of uh, his country, his nation, his religion, his friends. Well, no, not exactly. He is weeping because its inhabitants don't know of the destruction that's to, be, to befall them, and he's crying because they're ignorant. And yet, that's not quite either. He weeps because he had uh, come to save Israel. <coughs> and um, that their lives might be filled with joy and with abundant hope. And what Israel does instead is rejects him. He came so that their lives indeed could be filled with peace. And they couldn't have that. I'm going to back up and um, make this personal, not personal sense of me. We, we look at this passage, obviously what I'm talking about is Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And that doesn't mean primarily the Prince of doing the of warfare. It means it's the one who will bring you the inward peace that you need. And so you contrast that with families and people and places and countries and villages who simply are hell-bent on destruction. Yeah, they, they, they just have to have their own way. They have to do what they want to do. And Jesus looks out to these families. He looks out to these individuals. He looks out to me, anybody else. He looks out to these nations. He looks out to our nation. He looks out to our nation. I have no doubt in my mind. And he says, I have come to bring you peace, but what you people want to do is study war. You just have to be angry. You have to be angry with the Jews. You have to be angry with the Arabs. You have to be angry with uh, uh, whoever it might be. You just can't figure it out. You just have to be hateful. And so if you're going to continue being hateful, this is what's going to happen to you. I'm not going to come and destroy you. This is what's going to happen to you because of the hatred inside of you and the lack of serenity and the lack of peace which I want to give you. And it's like a parent that goes to his or her child and wants to give them this love and the child rejects it and all you can do is watch them destroy themselves. And so you just back off and watch your children die. And you just weep because there's nothing you can do <coughs> They have made up their minds. They made up their minds. He weeps because he has chosen, 
he had chosen. He had wanted Israel and understood them to be chosen, to be people and a nation of peace, and instead they became a nation of violence. And what they did is they submitted to the authority the power of the world, and they received what the world would give you, and that's your destruction. And indeed, as I mentioned, uh, 40 years after this prophecy of Jesus, um, Israel no longer existed. And so that's the back story to the happy story of Palm Sunday, but that's a story that needs to be told as well. Amen and amen. Easter is coming. Be of good cheer. Um, to be so kind, those able, please stand and we'll sing our closing hymn, number 88, Our Glory, Lord, and Lord. <laughs> families of peace, and churches of peace, and communities of peace. I would ask blessings upon everybody in this church as well, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.